I'm going to go through kind of bottom line basics on stem cell medicine. You know, there's signal to noise ratio that's talked about. So there's a lot of noise and a small amount of signal. And I'm going to tell you the signal, kind of the bottom line information, which is really not particularly controversial. Um, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end, because I know people that come to these talks usually have interest about various disorders. So this is the Prodromo Stem Cell Institute, credibility through research. Uh, the research goes through the forum, the Foundation for Orthopedics and Regenerative Medicine. Um, I put my name on the Stem Cell Institute with some hesitation at the encouragement of others because this field is about credibility. And so, um, you know, your work is only as credible as, as you are. So we welcome people to, to read about um, us. My background is um, I was born and raised in the Chicago area, attended Princeton, studied biology, an MD from Johns Hopkins, internship at the University of Chicago in orthopedic surgery residency at Rush, and then a fellowship in orthopedics and sports medicine at the Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. I've been board certified in orthopedic surgery forever. I've been practicing for 37 years. Um, I was assistant professor at Rush of orthopedics from 1986 to 2014, sports medicine specialist. My practice has gotten to be less and less orthopedics and more and more regenerative medicine. So I stepped back in 2014 to focus on my foundation and stem cell work and regenerative work. I still do some orthopedic work. I'm a sports medicine guy. Um, I'm editor in chief of the anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction and basic science. That's the textbook for orthopedic surgeons on the ACL. I was asked to put that together in 2007 based on some pioneering research that I did in that area. Um, and we had a second edition come out recently. So I've been very active in academic medicine for decades and have first authored dozens of papers and good journals. Um, I founded the orthopedic, the Foundation for Orthopedics and Regenerative Medicine and the Prodromal Stem Cell Institute, which is how I spend most of my time now. I have offices in Glenview, Illinois, Chicago suburb, in Bonita Springs, and in Antigua, where we do our stem cell work. Our phone number and email are, are listed there. So my practice evolved from a traditional orthopedic surgery, sports medicine, knee and shoulder surgery practice when I read about the proven results of stem cell treatment. Originally, I used it to treat osteoarthritis, and I still do, but then branched out to other types of arthritis, inflammatory arthritis, such as rheumatoid arthritis. And the more I got into it and became aware of the tremendous uh, potential that it had, I uh, branched out now and we charged our research people with finding all of the areas where stem cell treatment has proven efficacy. And our goal is to bring this treatment to those people because it can be hard to access, as I will describe. Um, I founded the Research Foundation in 2003 and our research associates um, who are listed online are very smart people who helped me to know everything in the stem cell field and to publish world-leading clinical research, which is what we do. Um, so to wit, how do stem cells work? They decrease inflammation, as for example, Humira and Embril and Cortisone do, that everybody's familiar with. But the remarkable, wonderful thing is they do so with no side effects, no predisposition to infection, for example. And that's kind of a blanket statement, but I will explain to you later why it's unquestionably true. And we, for example, published a paper in a very good journal um, about eight months ago. We reviewed every paper published using mesenchymal stem cells. These are adult stem cells. And I'll emphasize now and I'll emphasize later that the stem cells that we use are adult stem cells. We don't do anything with embryonic or fetal stem cells. There used to be ethical concerns about that. There are still ethical concerns. But almost all of the work done in this field for the last two decades has nothing whatever to do with that. So, and we don't, just want to make that clear. Anyway, we published a paper. There were something like 45 or 50 cohorts of people who had gotten stem cells of various kind. And we looked for what we call serious adverse events. And there were none, not a one, zero in all of these papers. And this is everything published in what's called the PubMed Index literature. So there are peer-reviewed journals. But peer review isn't the main thing. The main thing is, are these journals indexed in, for example, PubMed, where only good journals get in. There are a lot of them, but only good journals. So that's, we just look at good journals. 
So no serious adverse events. There were minor adverse events. People would have soreness in a joint after injection. You kind of expect that. Um, you know, things like that. But serious adverse events, nothing. So when I say there are none, we back it up. This is the definitive paper on the subject. We published it. Um, we are in the process of publishing several other papers in this regard. We have one about, we've looked at thousands of papers our research people have gone through. Every place where stem cells have been given intravenously for a variety of disorders, looking for serious adverse events. Also intrathecally, that means by lumbar puncture for um, neurologic problems. And I, I don't have time to get into all of that for purposes of this talk, but I can tell you they are extraordinarily safe. Um, so, I started out to tell you what they do. They decrease inflammation, but without side effects, serious side effects, and they helped damage tissue to heal. So drugs decrease inflammation, but they have potentially serious adverse events. Stem cells don't. But no drug helps your tissue to heal. In fact, virtually all of those drugs, um, especially non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, Motrin, Advil, Aleve, Diclofenac, Meloxicam, interfere with healing. And again, I could go on for a long time about this, but this is unquestionably true and not controversial. Cortisone obviously does, so do these other ones. Mesenchymal stem cells actually help you to heal. No drug does this, Mother Nature does this. All we're doing is helping Mother Nature help you. So disorders where stem cells have shown proven efficacy. We now have something like 30 protocols on clinicaltrials.gov. These are all areas where stem cells have shown some efficacy, and it's variable. We are not interested in being the first to try stem cells on a wing and a prayer. We're interested in finding areas where there is at least some proven efficacy, and then studying it and making it available to people. So I'm going to go over a list here. We have a few patient testimonials along the way. So osteoarthritis. When I was canvassing the audience, many people here were interested in osteoarthritis of various areas, from knees to spines and whatnot. So um, I say osteoarthritis instead of joint replacement. We do studies. We study also platelet-rich plasma. We have the biggest papers that exist on platelet-rich plasma. We just had one accepted for a worldwide meeting. The International Cartilage Repair Society, one of the best meetings in the world, 580 knees, three to seven year follow-up. Nobody has anywhere near that many knees, anywhere near that length of uh, follow-up. And I will tell you, and the stem cells work even better, that um, three quarters of the people, this is beyond three years, did not need joint replacements. Even the bone-on-bone -bone people was about two-thirds of them. So we use stem cells, we use PRP, we use hyaluronic acid, we do a lot of work with nutritional supplements, which again, I don't have time to get into tonight. But with that paradigm, a majority of the people that we see that have been told they need joint replacements wind up not needing them. Now, you know, maybe that won't go for 30 years, but we have people with horrific looking joints, older people, and our results are good. It's just that our field and the healthcare system has sort of gotten away from the idea of exploring ways to make joints heal. Joint replacements are wonderful things in the right people, not so wonderful sometimes, and the system has gotten oriented that way, and that's great. I used to do them myself years ago, um, but if, you, if your goal is to try to get the joints to heal, not healing like you're 17, but heal to where you can be functional and avoid drugs, um, results are very good. Anyway, here is um, a patient. This is uh, Mary. We're going to show you. It's a couple of minutes long. I was diagnosed with bilateral arthritis and uh, spoke with several excellent doctors here in Naples, uh, but was never given a good option in terms of treatment other than let me know when you need surgery. I have a wonderful trainer who kept encouraging me to, to look into stem cell therapy because he knew of so many athletes that had benefited from that. And um, none of the surgeons, again, that I spoke with uh, previously had even mentioned that option. And I was fortunate enough to have a friend who had had a uh, PRP injection from Dr. Perdromos. And she said, I know he does stem cell treatments. And I was very fortunate, called Dr. Pedromos. He was going to be in town in the next couple of weeks, and I was able to get in to see him. 
The difference in the treatments uh, of stem cell in the United States versus outside is that they can be, uh, you can receive many more stem cells and it can be much more effective. Uh, so Dr. Pedromos gave me the option of going out of the country to have the stem cell treatment, uh, which we did. Uh, the procedure was a uh, very smooth operation. Uh, it was, I wouldn't call it painful. It was maybe a little uncomfortable, but it was a fairly easy uh, treatment process, which was very nice. The recovery uh, time was minimal. I took it easy for the first week, and then after that I gradually was able to just ease myself back into my activities, which involved uh, workouts, golf, everyday activities, as I felt comfortable doing that. It's been about six, six full months now since my treatment, so I think I'm at a full benefit uh, from this point at this point uh, from the treatment so totally different from prior to the treatment I, I played golf this morning shot a 79 I can play golf as often as I want without any pain or discomfort which is incredible I easily get through my workouts now they were more of a grind in terms of trying to find positions where I could do things and not feel pain Stem cell therapy is life-changing. Uh, the research that Dr. Prodromos is doing is extraordinary. He has uh, certainly changed my life, and I'm sure many others who I haven't had the opportunity to meet. Please call 847-699-6810 or email at care at the pSCI.com probably don't look at x-rays every day, but we put the x-ray up there. It doesn't get any worse. Hers was bone on bone, bone spurs. She had almost no motion in her shoulder when I saw her, and, and she's got some more motion now, but the, you know, but, but the main thing is the pain. And you know, shoulder replacements can be effective, but I will tell you they're overall less effective, or less reliably effective than hip and knee replacements, and if joint if joint replacements go bad or if they wear out, there's usually not really a, a, a good path back. Um, she had a great result. Most of our patients have good results. You know, they're, they're variable. Um, and I, you know, I didn't promise her that she would have no pain at all. I'm glad that she did. And I expect the results to last her a long time. Um, it can be repeated later. You can do a booster with PRP, something like that. Um, um, so that's osteoarthritis, uh, we, do, we do all um, peripheral joints. So uh, hips, knees, ankles, whatever. We have a huge database, so we have a pretty good idea of who we can help and who we can't. Even joints that are bone on bone and don't move in shoulders and knees tend to do well. I will tell you that hips that are bone on bone and don't move don't do well, and so I, I usually don't treat people. Sometimes with PRP you can quiet their pain a little. But again, we've, we've got thousands of people, um, you know, hands, you, pretty much you name it. So we're going in with an educated idea as to what we can do. Um, the next on there is MS. Um, so, you know, each of these diseases is a long discussion in and of itself, which I don't have time to do. Um, but MS is an autoimmune disorder, as people generally know, in which your body attacks itself. Um, stem cells are consistently effective in improving MS. There are different ways to do it, um, different methods to do it, um, but it's, it's almost always effective to some degree, some more than others, because it, quiet, it does two things. It quiets the body's attacking itself, and the, they're called upper motor neurons that are damaged. It, it helps them to heal. Um, resistant back pain, several people asked about that. Um, there's actually a lot to be said about that, which, again, I, I didn't put in here. So we have been ramping up what we do with stem cells. Um, we started in Antigua earlier this year and started off doing more peripheral joints. We're doing autoimmune disorders. We're doing spines. Uh, we did our first several spines last time I was there. We had a gentleman sent to me by the chief of spine surgery at Rush, actually, who's interested in regenerative medicine. He's a guy I know, fabulous um, surgeon. Um, who had had um, 13 years of lower back pain, said he slept with pain pills at his bed every night, had had terrible problems um, 
in his neck, had had an artificial disc put in by this doctor, Dr. Fessler, who's a fantastic doctor, <clears throat> which restored function to his arm and got rid of a lot of his pain. Um, so so we, we injected him with stem cells. Five days after the stem cell treatment, he said his lower back pain was almost entirely gone. He was able to sleep, didn't need pain pills anymore. His neck, which we weren't even treating actually, the stem cells from an epidural lumbar spine found their way up and got rid of his residual neck pain. And so we are expanding our stem cell um, work. I'll talk a little more about this later. But the spine is, is a very fertile area um, to do this. We actually have a terrific, and I mentioned him later, a pain doctor, Ken Candido from Chicago. He's one of the best people in the world. And we bring him down to do it. So I inject peripheral joints, and I supervise things that are IV. But <clears throat> you, know, you want somebody who's really good at their particular area. And there's nobody better anywhere than him. So he comes down specifically, um, specifically to do this. We're doing more complicated people. There is tremendous research showing some regeneration of discs, restoration of bones, all, all kinds of things. So we're, we're extremely excited about our spine work and are doing more of it. Um, Anti-aging. So here's another one. So this gentleman's interesting. He also has arthritis all over. He's a, he's a great guy. He's a former Marine bodybuilder, uh, did very well in stocks and whatnot. But his body is just a wreck, surgery all over, um, and some other um, issues as well. He came down um, once and did so well he came back. We did this when he came back. I'm here, this is my second treatment. Uh, I live in chronic pain. I came down here to uh, Antigua about two months ago. I received my first treatment, and my pain went from about a seven to a two. So I'm here again to do it again to keep the momentum going. Dr. Padromas is excellent. Yeah, everything is very smooth to the point. You know, um, the injections are no problem. The IV is no problem, you know, there's really no problem. Everything is smooth there. The resort is beautiful. I'm pretty in tune with my body, and when they did these stem cells, they do 50 million at a clip through an IV. And I was just laying there, and all of a sudden, I felt my lungs opening up. I just took a breath, and I just kept just inhaling. I was able to inhale more and more and more. And I says, oh my God, I said, this stuff is working right now. 100% go with Vitro Biopharma, the Aloe RX stem cells. These are definitely probably the best in the world. And uh, I would definitely recommend Dr. Padromas and coming down to uh, Antigua. I did this eight weeks ago. I f I'm totally different. My energy level went from a, a two to a seven. I I'm, I'm good. Very, that's why I'm here again. I want to keep the momentum going. And I plan on doing it again probably next year, maybe in May. I'll, I'll, I'll do this again and probably once a year for the rest of my life. So he got, so, so stem cells find their way. They have, they're genetically programmed to home in to inflamed areas. So when you inject them IV, but we also injected um, multiple joints um, and some other issues, um, some other issues as well. But by the way, <laughs> you know, nobody was paid to do this. People paid to have treatment. These were just all people that wanted to say what, um, what happened. Um, um, so the anti-aging is interesting and we um, talk to, there, there are, anti-aging is its own field um, and there are medications and there are all kinds of supplements and I talked to these people. We were contacted by this large company that deals with high-end executives about doing stem cells because in their opinion, and they're very smart anti-aging people, um, doing stem cells was an integral part of an anti-aging process. So um, regarding the question about anti-aging, you know, it's kind of difficult to predict if something's going to make you live longer. Um, but the idea is that um, hopefully to help people live better um, while, they, while they are living. Uh, autism, it's a very interesting topic. Um, so, so stem cells work consistently well for autism. And that surprised me. So we look at all these disorders, and my research people bring me these studies. And I saw this, and I thought, well, why? You know, I, I didn't even think people knew what autism was. So what we found is that autism is a bona fide autoimmune disorder. We have a whole file on it. There's 30 some papers, more actually. So autism makes antibodies um, against nerve cells. Um, it's, it's been referred to as an allergy to the brain. It 
works in the immune system with, where lymphocytes a, a, attack tissue, but also with mast cells, which make histamine. It's another kind of an immune response. Um, and um, we talked to some autism societies to let people know, and, and people have been skeptical. We have to send them these papers. So once you understand that it really is an autoimmune disorder, it makes perfect sense to understand why it helps. And the blood-brain barrier, which pre prevents substances from getting into your brain, is porous when the nervous system is inflamed, as it is in autism. So, so these um, children use it, young adults, um, can just be injected intravenously, which is much better tolerated than having to stick a needle in somebody's spine, something, um, something like that. So, so the point of this is, though, that you know, we know of autism as a behavioral disorder manifesting, which it primarily is, but there are reasons for the behavior. And the reason is that these neurons are, are, are sick, they're damaged. And that's why they're manifesting. It actually turns out, and again, another discussion for another day, that even schizophrenia and other neurologic disorders probably has some autoimmune components. Um, so, you know, other things that are done, behavioral treatment is great. Working with the microbiome is great. Um, but, but this is an autoimmune disorder, and that's why, that's why stem cells help. And they help um, consistently, and we're starting to do. We're doing an autistic patient there. Actually, we're going down um, next week. And, and, and hope to do more because it's a very vexing problem. Um, autoimmune arthritis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus scleroderma, psoriatic, there are, are others. So uh, uh, they can be pretty terrible diseases. Uh, this is a patient testimonial, um, a patient that had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, has rheumatoid arthritis, who we treated, I think, two months ago now. I've had rheumatoid arthritis since 2004. With the rheumatoid, you get flares, and at times I have to have like my son or my husband open things for me, and or even reach something because it just the muscle ache and everything. I've been on you know drugs and and prednisone forever. It, it seems like since 2008, and um, it, it really is hard on your body. But I would flare. And then with the flare, then you'd have to get a shot of cortisone. I'd walk out of my appointments with six shots in my hands or in my feet, and um, it's painful. And then hopefully that works, or they'd have to put me on a high dose of prednisone, methyl prednisone packs and everything. It got to the point where it wasn't even working anymore. And so I had to go on to this orencia, which is the mildest of the biologics. Um, it still lowers your immune system, though, and you know things can happen, but that seemed like that was helping for a while. Um, the problem is, is that I have a hard time finding a vein. It's just more maintaining, and that's what I've always said. When I, when I was told I had this disease, and I walked into somebody's office, the first doctor I ever saw, and I see these women with the deformed hands and just maintaining, and I knew I just, you know, it's like I didn't want to be in that world, although I was. My husband actually recommended Dr. Padronos to me. Um, and his friend recommended it to him. And he suggested when I had gone to um, an orthopedic and um, on, for my wrists that were really bad, I was wearing wrist brace and getting shots in them and they had gotten an x-ray and you know they said, really, your next step is getting it fused. Um, I've had my toes fused, I've had my knees replaced. I didn't want to do that. Dr. Padromos met with me and my mom um, for a long time, and he said that's basically not good for people, that, that's not very effective in the wrist for patients with rheumatoid, um, and brought up the stem cells and what they're doing. His credentials were just blew me out of the water when I was looking at his credentials. I thought, uh, this seems like the one that would you know, be worth a try. And I guess for me, I put it in my mind, I was going to Antigua. <laughs> so I've never been there before. It was beautiful down there, just gorgeous, nice and warm. And they took care of getting our COVID um, um, test before we went back. Um, so everything, everything was just taken care of. So I got the stem cell treatment. And to be honest, it, it was, um, you know, it, it, it's a shot in the wrist and everything. and. Um, after that, after the wrist calmed down, I'm, I'm not on, I don't have my wrist braces on anymore. So I have that movement again. My, my shoulders aren't hurting anymore. Um, I'm walking better. I had it in my wrist. My back was continuously going out and that, you know, is prevents you from doing things. And it's 
it's been in there for what it's been like eight weeks now so um, that that's a ton better I have so many friends with autoimmune diseases friends with um, kids with autism type 1 diabetes I have been telling I have been telling people about this I guess that that is the final thought I want to see so many people healed with this that I do hope that it gets more prevalent I do want to go do this again because I think it would give me even more benefits her wrist and her forearm, the bones looked like candle wax. They were, it, her wrist was almost com completely off of the forearm, so it's kind of way past the point, in my opinion, where, where fusion would do anything um, for her. Um, she's got other issues, her problems in her feet, and she'd had surgery there, which you know didn't go well. Um, so, um, um, you know, there's limitations to what can happen when you start taking high doses of these drugs, you can get side effects and whatnot. And again, it's a pretty remarkable thing. Um, and it was painful for when I injected a wrist, it was painful. Normally injecting a wrist is the world's easiest thing, but the bones were so melted together, it was hard to even find a space. The anatomy was so distorted, but you know, we did. Um, and, and so any kind of inflammatory arthropathy, they're called, and so, rheumatoid, lupus scleroderma, any of these things, again, you know, responses are variable, but they're, it's not a shot in the dark. They're consistently effective at least to a degree, um, and, and most of it probably from the intravenous because these cells are, are programmed to find where the problem is. So, um, um, uh, we're actually, we're particularly anxious to get started with scleroderma too, which is just a horrific disorder for which there is not great treatment and you can actually inject in the hands and help their skin. Um, um, so stroke and heart disease. So this is interesting. And again, I, I, I keep saying these are other discussions for other days. It's, there's just a lot to talk about. But conventional stem cell injections um, for stroke have not been effective. Um, in heart disease, it's been sort of variable. And I, I don't have time to get into it now, but there are, there are things that we're starting to do using your own T cells. And this is kind of the next step with stem cell work and the immune system that have provided efficacy. And we are looking forward to treating people with that. Um, so we, by the way, so we have this email and people can contact us and we talk to people and they're usually pretty long calls and there's no charge for this. We had a call with a lady from Brisbane, Australia, who's going to be coming down. We have a person from Turkey. So people from pretty much, um, Pretty, pretty much all over. So the stroke work is, is just getting going, but it's a, it's a very exciting frontier. Um, heart disease as well. So Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. Um, I just had a 35-year-old patient whose entire colon was removed. The disease was so bad, it also predisposed to colon cancer. Um, and it's, uh, again, it's, it's, a, it's an autoimmune disorder. Your body attacks itself, and when you treat with stem cells, it, it gets better, it doesn't get cured but it gets better and it gets better safely. The early studies in Crohn's disease, they were catheterizing arteries and putting it into the artery. It turns out you don't need to do that. Almost all of the original studies, whether it's in the carotid or these other arteries, um, it turns out you don't need to, that if you just inject these things intravenously, they have this homing mechanism and they, and they find their way, or, or the growth factors from them find their way. Uh, diabetes, uh, type one and type two. Um, uh, uh, predictably effective. We've done type 2. We're starting to do type 1. Depends a little how long you've had the type 1, whether your islet cells are completely destroyed or not. Earlier um, is better. Chronic kidney failure. We've treated a few people with that. We had a patient with severe kidney failure, where so far it doesn't seem to have helped. We had a gentleman with earlier, stage 1 or 2, who, who normalized. Um, his GFR, it's called, is normal. The protein in his urine um, is almost gone. Um, and you know, part of the problem in this whole field is it is so restricted um, that there just there aren't many studies done. Every patient that we treat is part of a database, is part of a study. We evaluate them prospectively, and then every six months, one year, two years. For the PRP, we've got people out to eight and nine years. This is very, very expensive to do. So I pay people at our foundation. You have to call people. You have to find them to get good data. Um, most places maybe don't do this, but we do because it's the only way you can advance the field. And the more of this we do and the more data we get, the more we can fine tune our indications and see who it works better for and how many cells, that sort of thing. Um, uh, ED, Peyronie's disease, 
uh, we're about to do a Pironis patient. And um, good studies showing um, efficacy for problems. Uh, Pironis in particular is very vexing. It's painful. There really aren't good treatments for it. Um, COPD, asthma, pulmonary fibrosis. Somebody asked about pulmonary fibrosis. So efficacy um, with early pulmonary fibrosis in the literature. We actually, we had a patient with fairly severe disease from Georgia who was too sick to fly to Antigua. We asked the FDA for permission to treat on a compassionate use. We do this from time to time. And um, it was very sad that, um, I'm sorry, we just, we talked to this guy. And he, um, he, he went downhill <coughs> and, and recently died before we could treat him. I don't know if we could have helped him, but maybe. Um, cerebral palsy. Um, cerebral palsy, um, sort of like autism. Cerebral palsy is a disease um, where your body attacks itself. Um, and we have children. We have a, a, a young child from Brazil who we, who we may be bringing in. But we have to be careful because these children are fragile. Um, and we're in some other countries that, that have a more in, in, intense care in case something happens. But it's, it, it is often effective. Uh, early dementia. So we get calls all the time about uh, Alzheimer's disease. So for, for full-fledged Alzheimer's, it, there's no evidence that it does anything. But for early dementia, there's good evidence that it does. Uh, traumatic brain injury, um, maybe CTE, we don't know. Um, eye disease, um, it's another area that we're just getting started with. Um, but for all of those disorders that you see there, retinitis pigmentosa, diabetic, um, so-called nonproliferative diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration, optic nerve damage glaucoma, there, uh, with, with, uh, uh, there, is, there is evidence of efficacy. Um, the trick there is to not make the cure worse than the disease. So um, we, there's a, an excellent ophthalmologist, um, uh, Jack Zamora, who will be flying down. Uh, we're talking to our first patients now. So we will be injecting what's called subtenon. So it's in the eye, but around the eye. So there's different places you can inject. You can inject in the vitreous humor, which has some risk. You can inject on the retina. You can inject on the choroid, which is the blood vessels. All of those have shown efficacy, but all of them have shown some risk. We'll be injecting um, over the sclera, it's called. And nobody has found any risk from doing that. It's easy to do. And again, these stem cells find their way. So, um, so we're, we're starting to work in that realm as well. Um, so where do these stem cells come from? Uh, so we use primarily Wharton's jelly derived from umbilical cords. So again, these are not from embryos or not from fetuses. Ladies, after a term cesarean section, donate their umbilical cords. The umbilical cords are then taken to the tissue bank. We work with, um, it's called Vitro Biopharma um, in Colorado. Um, they are, in my opinion, the world's best producers and supplier of these cells. They work with studies at Harvard and Stanford and elsewhere. Um, um, and so the cells are isolated, they're cultured, they're grown, um, and they're tested. So these are adult cells, just as though they came from you, but they're younger, so there's some evidence that they're a little more potent. They're also less expensive to produce because they can be produced and frozen, um, and then they're flown out to Antigua before, before we treat people. Um, and again, they're very different from embryonic stem cells um, in ways that I, I won't get into, but they, so then you ask about rejection. These are somebody else's cells. Are they rejected? No, there was no clinical rejection phenomena. There is, your body recognizes them as foreign, but there's called major histocompatibility HLA-B2 antigens that cause rejection and they don't have them. Um, embryonic stem cells um, do, so they don't, so we can use them freely. Um, we don't use them in people that are markedly immunosuppressed because in people whose immune systems are, are, are markedly immunosuppressed, which for example, Karen, who you saw was not, um, they can take root and grow. So in those people, we would use your own cells. But for all of the arthritic patients and almost everybody we treat, we can use those and have had um, great success. Um, the other thing we can do is take your own um, adipose tissue. So we can take a specimen from you and send it to a tissue bank which grows them. Um, and then they're flown down and we can inject them. These are, again, adult cells. Um, and they're, you know, so we, we have studied this literature as, as much as any people on the planet. We've looked, there's cells from fat, there's umbilical cells, you can get them from bone marrow, um, and there's some other things, but those are the three that are mostly done. And there's no convincing evidence that any one is any better than, than another. The adipose cells are more expensive, um, and it's a second procedure to get them, although it's not onerous. So um, 
so it is not the first option we offer, although for some things, for example, in an immunosuppressed patient, it is, or if a patient just wanted um, their own cells. So, um, but, they're, but they're the same kind of um, adult cells. Um, uh, patients receive 100 to 200 million stem cells, um, and I'll explain why that's significant in a minute. Um, so where do we treat patients? We evaluate patients in person in our Chicago area office or in Naples or remotely. And I'd say at this point, a majority of our patients are evaluated remotely from, um, from all over the world. Um, um, people are screened basically by our staff and given basic information. And, and then in people who, for whom it may be appropriate, I talk to people and we, these are, these are time consuming. We find out about people, we look into these in detail. Every patient who needs this is different. Um, and then we provide the stem cell treatment um, in Antigua. So why do we treat in Antigua? Um, stem cell treatment is illegal in the US except for bone marrow aspirin. Um, and why is that? Um, this tissue did not used to be regulated until 2005. And it's regulated because the FDA would like to make very sure that people don't have treatment that's harmful. And the FDA is, does, does great things, and they do great things with drugs. Um, tissue is different than drugs. Um, unfortunately, they've started applying the same standards to stem cells as they have to drugs, which means that to get them legalized, you need double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled studies. These studies are very, very expensive to do. The pharmaceutical companies have the money to do them, and they do a great job with drugs. Um, <clears throat> but pharmaceutical companies are generally not in the stem cell business and don't monetize it, so wouldn't expect them to pay for these studies. The problem is there's really nobody to pay for them. Um, they still get done. Some universities do them. It's just um, made it extremely difficult to, um, to access them. And many of us thought that they would become more legalized here, but it sort of hasn't happened. And so most of the stem cell work in our hemisphere has been driven offshore. There's a big stem cell clinic in Panama and the Caymans and Mexico, ours in Antigua and others. Um, so we have licensure there. Um, and because we do, we can use a stem cell registered bank, which Vitro Biopharma is. Um, and it's a wonderful clinic. But that's, that's why we're Antigua in Antigua is to bring this um, this treatment uh, to people. Um, we're at a clinic there with a, a wonderful doctor, Dr. Joseph John is his name. He was uh, a native Antiguan. He was, went to Columbia to the medical school, did a residency in New York, another one in, um, in, uh, at, at Yale, and was called back by the Antiguan government 25 years ago or so to modernize their health system. He supervised the building of their public hospital. He started their medical school. He's, he's a fantastic doctor. He was just knighted by the British Commonwealth about two months ago for his work by an act of parliament. So it's a wonderful state-of-the-art um, clinic, and it's the right place to be. We, we have licensure, so we, we just want to be able to deliver high-quality care, and we can do it there. Um, so what is legal in the United States? Uh, bone marrow aspirate is, is legal. You can stick a trocar in bone, take bone marrow aspirate out. Um, but the FDA does not let us concentrate the cells. So what that means is that uh, for 100 cc's of uh, bone marrow, for example, you can get maybe 100,000 stem cells, maybe a few more. There are other cells, many other cells, but bone marrow is less than a tenth of a percent of the cells in this bone marrow aspirate. So most of these treatments will inject perhaps 100,000 stem cells, maybe even 200,000, maybe only 50,000, whereas we're injecting 100 million or more. Um, and we have canvassed the literature. For example, the paper that I referenced earlier on arthritis, we included in their bone marrow aspirate treatment for arthritis. And there was a qualitative difference between bone marrow aspirate efficacy and stem cell efficacy. And for orthopedic applications in general, bone marrow aspirate has not been effective. It is effective for fractures that don't heal. But used in conjunction with joint replacements, used for arthritis, used for rotator cuff disorders, there were abundant papers showing that it just isn't um, consistently effective. There are some places, um, um, there was a doctor um, who has done some work in the eye and actually has had some success. So not to say that it can never work, um, but because it is so limited, they're not just stem cells and there are so few of them, maybe you wouldn't expect it to work as well, and it doesn't. So it puts a tremendous restriction on what can be done in the United States. 
So if you were told you had stem cell treatment, but did not have a trocar inserted into a pelvic bone, you either were scammed or you received illegal treatment. And both take place a lot in the United States. And we get people all the time who have been told they had um, treatment um, that was stem cell treatment that really wasn't. Um, you can take fat and just grind up the fat and inject it, but you're not allowed to isolate the stem cells. Um, and that's called stem cell treatment. Actually, you can't call it that, or the FDA will give you a hard time. And there are stem cells in it, but there aren't that many, and your body has to break down fat. Actually, we did studies of this. We published a paper, something like 80 patients, where we did bone marrow aspirate and fat and PRP, trying to work with what we could. And we had decent results from moderate arthritis. We actually presented it at a big meeting, but they just weren't good enough. And I, you know, and it cost a few bucks too. And I just, so I just stopped. And and then we got more serious about doing what we knew does work. Um, and by the way, where do these studies come from? Um, most of them now, the best ones come from um, China, um, Korea, some other random places um, where they kind of foster this um, kind of work. Um, I, and I said you were either scammed or received a legal, legal treatment unless you were part of one of the small FDA stem cell trials. And they do exist, but they're very small and they're very hard to get into. And they're just, there just aren't many of them and they usually have placebo arms as well. <laughs> So, um, um, you know, Antigua, I was just describing, um, it's, uh, um, you know, we're there for the medical reasons, and, um, um, and it's a beautiful and safe venue um, uh, to go to. Um, so, I've said before that it's safe. So, you have to think about it from this perspective. There is just an awful lot of misinformation out there. And I have seen well-intended directives, documents, statements um, from government entities, from companies saying, boy, you really have to be careful. And you do have to be careful. But you have to be careful to make sure that you're getting bona fide, legitimate stem cell treatment by appropriate people. But you know, properly performed stem cell treatment, like. You know, it, it has to be safe. This is nature's evolved way of healing our bodies, right? So we would all be extinct. The, your body makes stem cells, and it brings those stem cells to points of damage. So how could it be that they would be dangerous, right? You know? And so we, you know, there are obviously no medication side effects. Uh, there are no surgical complications. There's no surgery. These are just simple injections. Um, tumorogenicity has been brought up. Um, we are just finishing another paper on, actually finishing, we're about halfway through it, um, where we're looking at instances of tumors from stem cells. So there's four parts to this paper. One is adult stem cells in people. Another is adult stem cells in animals. Another is embryonic stem cells, even though we don't use them in people. And another is embryonic stem cells in animals. So we're finished with the part about looking at adult stem cells in people. And there is no tumorogenicity, none, ever recorded. We've gone through every paper that we could find, thousands of papers. In, um, in the PubMed index literature looking for it. So it just doesn't happen. Yet we've heard people talk about maybe it's a problem. We've seen some, you know, and I won't get into them, some case reports and things in the paper about tumors, but, but it just hasn't happened. So, you know, uh, infections. There are, in, in all of these papers that I mentioned in this arthritis study, these 50 cohorts, all of the people published, zero infections, not a one. The only, now, now look, and, and to be clear, and I'll mention this again, you can go to a back room in the United States or in some other place and bad things can happen, and bad things have happened. I'm talking about qualified people using this appropriately. And by the way, you can get surgery by an unqualified person, let's just say, um, and you can have problems, right? You know? So anything done wrongly can lead to problems, but properly done stem cells, so infections. The only infections ever reported for stem cells um, properly done have been in the lumbar spine, in discs. And there have been a few, about a one in a 1,000 incidents. But you should know that the lumbar discs are prone to infection if you do a discogram or inject cortisone. And the incidence is about the same. And you can pretty much eliminate that, we think, by putting antibiotics in with the stem cells as we do with cortisone. But that's it. And that's, that's and I don't, it's not because of stem cells. It's just because the lumbar disc is a little prone to it. And even then, the incidence is something like one in a 1,000. But infections seem no place else. So we thought to ourselves, we said, well, we look for adverse events in these studies. And then we said, well, what could go wrong? You know, what are we forgetting? And we looked for those things, too. And you know, it, they're just incredibly safe, properly done. And again, uh, there's a category we call egregious use. 
So we have, we've looked at legal databases. We've looked at um, um, uh, 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 journalistic websites looking for things that have gone wrong. And we, and we found them. And every one that we found, and there aren't even many even then, um, have been because of what we call egregious use, meaning people doing bad things that shouldn't have been doing them, you know, doing them, doing them wrongly. So, um, so a key part of this is um, if you're going to have stem cell treatment from us or from somebody else, it's just very important that you make sure that they're reputable people. Again, that's why I have my name on the stem cell site. We're, we're trying to, and, and we're not the only people doing what I consider to be good work, but there's so much demand for stem cells. Um, and the supply is so limited because of the regulatory constraints that it just kind of breeds supply from people doing it that you know, maybe it's not the best thing for them to be doing. So treatment logistics. Um, evaluation is carried out remotely. P patients fly to Antigua, usually come in the day before, do it that day, leave the next day. Uh, we have an agreement with the Hodges Bay Resort. It's a beautiful place. Where it's right on the ocean. It's 10 minutes from the airport, 10 minutes from the clinic. Uh, we have a special arrangement with them. We have a private car that transports you to when you get there. An IV is started. Um, the cells are transported in liquid nitrogen from Colorado all through the airplane, temperature controlled to the clinic. They're stored there in liquid nitrogen once we have IV access. We thaw the cells. By the way, I did all of this myself to begin with, and we have a trained team, and I still supervise it. So they're thawed, they're washed, and they're infused within 20 minutes of being thawed so that none of them um, die. Um, treatment takes usually about an hour, and then you go back to the resort, um, and you can go back the, uh, the, the next day. Um, uh, treatment cost in our hands is less than other offshore clinics offering legitimate stem cell treatment. Um, um, and again, you know, beware if you see treatment that's, um, you, you need to check out where you're getting treatment. And I, we've seen treatment offered that was very, very inexpensive, but it really wasn't stem cell treatment. And the word stem cell are played fast and loose with pretty often. Uh, types of injections, all patients receive IV injections. Arthritis injections, I do. The spine, Dr. Candido. Uh, the, for ED and Peyronie's, we have a very good urologist, Dr. Rudd, and for the eye, Dr. Zamora. Um, so I mentioned our research foundation. Um, the forum, Foundation for Orthopedics and Regenerative Medicine. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. Profit, 100% of the funds go to research or helping fund patient care. For example, I don't, I don't take a salary from it. I pay our research assistants from it. Um, all donations are tax deductible. We believe there is no better use of your philanthropic donated dollars than helping support the work of our foundation. Um, I have funded this foundation almost exclusively myself um, um, since its inception. We are trying to expand our work, so we, for the first time we are now um, soliciting uh, outside donations. Great. Well, thank you all for your attention. I'll be here if you have other questions.